today's crime seminar. I am Nazan. I am excited to be the host today. Today we have two talks. Uh, will be given by five speakers. Uh, the first session is about regularization by architecture, deep learning for PD-based inverse problems. Uh, let's begin by introducing speakers for this session. The speakers are uh, Professor Peter Moss, uh, Derek Ganyotenio, and uh, Yannick Godeke. Uh, Peter Moss is a professor for applied mathematics at the Center for Industrial Mathematics at the University of Berman since 1999. His main research areas include inverse problems, machine learning, parameter uh, identification, and since several years, deep learning based on neural networks. Uh, professor Moss studied mathematics uh, in uh, Karlsruhe. Cambridge and uh, Heidelberg and obtained his doctorate in 1988 uh, from TU Berlin and his uh, mathematics from Saarland University in 1993. Peter Moss was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Saarland, Germany in 2018 and he's taking a leading, a leading role in numerous research projects. He's the speaker of the DFG funded research training group uh, 2024, parameter identification, uh, analysis, algorithms, applications, and was the deputy speaker of the DFG SFB uh, 747, micro code forming. And he's presently the deputy chairman of the committee for mathematical modeling, simulation, and optimization, uh, co-MSO, and member of the advisory board of uh, Interdisciplinary Center for Scientific Computing. Um, it's a long biography. Yeah, yeah. Professor Moss is a co-author of more than 100 publications in peer-reviewed literatures, three monographs, and 27 book chapters and he holds seven patents and patents application. So the, the next speaker is Yannick Godeke. Yannick Godeke is a PhD student of, uh, proof, uh, of Professor Moss at the University of Berman. His main field of research is about operator approximation theory of neural networks, in particular general generalization of universal approximation uh, theorems or quantification of the required uh, network size. Furthermore, he is involved in a research project in cooperation with the Institute of Environmental Physics Berman and the German Aerospace Center. Uh, it is about using deep learning methods for driving a surface estimate of uh, nitrogen uh, dioxide from geostationary satellite measurements. At the beginning of his PhD, he joined the Torch Physics project in which a deep learning library for, differ uh, for differential equation is developed. This project is in cooperation with uh, Robert Bosch uh, Stuttgart. Uh, he studied mathematics in Berman and at the University of Gutenberg, and he received his master's degree at uh, about complex scattering imaging at the University of Maryland in 2022. And the third speaker is uh, Derek Ganyotenio. Derek uh, is a research associate and PhD candidate at the University of Berman Center for Industrial uh, Mathematics in Germany under the supervision of Professor Moss. Uh, prior to joining the PhD program, Derek obtained his uh, Master of Science in Mathematical Science from the African Institute for Mathematical Science, uh, Ghana, which is a network of center of excellence in uh, excellence in applied mathematics across Africa. Uh, Derek worked on uh, semi-implicit methods for solving PDs using finite difference methods. Derek obtained a master, of, a master of Engineering, Electrical Engineering from the Ecole National Superior Polytechnic, uh, Polytechnic uh, de Yonde in Cameroon. So now we can start the talk. Yeah, thank you very much for this very extensive introduction. <laughs> so you can already go to the second page, actually. 
So it's a pleasure and honor to be able to present our part of our work in, in your team. And it's been, I think, more than two years since I met George in Leiden at this great uh, Lawrence Institute, where we had fun discussions about deep learning for PDEs. And I'm not sure whether we met in Cambridge, but uh, we followed your work for, for many, many years. So as you already mentioned, we come from a center for industrial mathematics. So we span the, span the, uh, from, let's go back. We span from industrial applications to mathematical theory. And I would like to highlight two of our industrial applications before I hand over to the PhD students for the more scientific talks. So please go to the next page. So our work sort of centers around three areas, ill post inverse problems, where we come, where we actually come from, fractalization theory for ill post inverse problems, and in particular for parameter identification problems for PDEs in tomography imaging, but also other applications. And recently, as you said, we combine this with data-driven neural network concepts. So what we actually want to do, mainly on the theoretical side, is to embed those neural network architectures in regular safety theory. And we have done analysis of several architectures and try to embed them in the general inverse problems theory, showing in, under which conditions they actually provide optimal regularization schemes for inverse problems. So if you go to the next page, but I would just like to highlight two industrial applications which we've been doing recently. And this one is actually sort of a low key application in terms of mathematics. It's more to highlight how, what it means to do transfer from mathematical knowledge into industrial environments. So this started two and a half years ago with a very small research project. So the mathematical part, I would say was about three months. And then the rest was testing, software development, employment, providing a dy dynamic link, li link, link library. And finally, the product release will be, will be next month at a fair in, in, in Germany. And this was in collaboration with the company who was testing cables. So when the company came around and said, you are well known for CT, we have a CT device for testing cables. We thought, well, yes, but the cables they are testing is they really test the maturity of all cables worldwide, which are on the ground of the oceans crossing, crossing the continents. So they have are sort of a hidden champion in, in the area of testing high quality products for, for telecommunication and other data transfer. And then they started uh, doing testing also for tubes. And if you go to the next page, and they were happy to do with round tubes, but then they went on for, for structured tubes, like the structure you can see here. And actually they only want to have three or four parameters determined from the X-ray measurements. So this sounded easy, but if you go to the next page, then this is rather complicated due to the environment you're in. So the, uh, the detector is rather wide, so you cannot use a ray transform. You have to use the widening of the beam. You have to incorporate that. You have a rather fast production line, nine meters per second. And even if the illumination is only three milliseconds, this accounts to about two centimeters. So you have heavy motion blur. And also on top of that, you have a rather unstable industrial environment, which is rattling and moving and shaking. And there's a high noise in, in the data and the compute power is, is limited. And overall, they only measure two directions. So classical methods did not work. So we used actually then deep learning for solving this. And this could be done with the standard unit finally to, to solve the segmentation problem and determine the parameters. If you go to the next one. So, and the second application I want to highlight, actually, if you go to the other demo, mm -hmm. is a rather high-tech demo, but further away from being used in an industrial environment. So in Bremen, they do provide part of the Ariane rocket, which is built by the Airbus company. And actually what they do is they build the outer core of the rocket and they have to combine it and to link it with the inside structure, which keeps the rocket and the, the workload of the, of the rocket. And weight is of the essence. If it doesn't work, then just, just leave it. Yeah. Then just go back to the original one, further back. OK, so what they want to do is they have the outer core, the outer skin of the rocket, 
and this has to be mounted on top of the inner structure and the weight is of the essence. Every kilogram of less weight you need for the outer, outer core, you can further add load to the, which payload to the, to the rocket. And one problem is to construct the so-called stringers, which connect the inner structure with the outer shelf. And they are sub, they need to sub, support very strong force profiles in very limited directions. So the question is how can you solve or construct this topology optimization problem in 3D efficiently to construct thousands of those little stringers, which differ slightly from position to position due to the varying force profile. So if you go to the next one. So I think you can go on. So the question always was to provide a data set and the main, main compliance function you have to satisfy is that the force and the, the displacements in the direction of the force have to be minimal. So whenever you use the displacement, you determine by classical mechanical engineering equations in the direction of the force, you don't want to have strong, strong replacements. So what we use is sort of equivalence to stabilize the process. And I think we can go on to the next page. And the main thing is to show that if you use physics in combination with the standard unit, you can reduce the number of training samples dramatically and reach still sufficiently good, good results. So that's what's now being used in terms of rapid prototyping at this Ariane, Ariane plant in, in Bremen. And we are still a bit away from having this in a more general setting, but we are working on getting this to a general topology optimization problems. But the three code, three D, three D code is running. So if you go to the next one, so finally I want to introduce our group. So at the Center for Industrial Mathematics, we have about a hundred scientists working, slightly more, and in our group for deep learning for inverse problems are about 20, 25 people, and we will now present some part of our work for deep learning for PDA PDE based inverse problems. So the next speaker is Derek Ganyutanyu presenting some comparison of methods for PDE-based inverse problems. So let's try to... Yes, okay. So uh, hello everyone. And... Uh, no, no, it's this other one. So it's it's nice to, to be at the Crunch Group Seminar at Brown University, the home of Pins and Zipponet. And uh, it was nice meeting George in person some months back in the Stockholm during the summer school organized by Katerina and team. So it's nice again to, to meet, do it virtually and present uh, some results of what we've been doing so far. Okay, so generally speaking, when we try to intersect the field of mathematics and deep learning, we, we kind of... Uh, view it on one part as mathematics for deep learning, where the objective is to understand deep learning architectures and then understand how they function in order to make them robust and improve their performances uh, in the deep learning in, in applications. And the other part, which is deep learning for mathematics, is interested in mostly solving problems in mathematics using deep learning, which is what uh, we are going to be focusing on right now. But then this has had a lot of uh, good results in imaging science and inverse problem in CT, EIT, and MRI, just as Peter mentioned. But recently also in partial differential equations with the development of new neural network architectures that seek to solve these problems. So uh, at the core, we work at the intersection of inverse problems and deep learning. And so we seek to use all these neural network architectures, not just to solve the forward problem, in a PDE, but to also for solve the PDE-based inverse problem or the parameter identification problem. So generally speaking, uh, when you look at a PDE of, of this nature, uh, the interest could be either to solve the forward problem or to do parametric studies where you're given lambda and you want to compute uh, a, a set of U that corresponds to lambda. Or even more interesting to Ross is to solve the inverse problem where you are given uh, uh, the solution or a measurement of the solution and then you want to compute the parameter. 
So, of course, this is not new to the audience, but just to mention, maybe for the sake of the recording and, and uh, maybe someone watching which who doesn't have some background. So, uh, deep learning methods for PDs, you get to distinguish two, function evaluation, uh, where we find the pins and the QRS and the deep read architecture, where the idea is for a neural network to uh, solve the PDE, uh, given uh, coordinates uh, in space or time or both. And so the neural network kind of approximates the solution of the PD at this coordinate point. So uh, for such a situation, we are basically dealing with a single uh, scenario. We are solving uh, a PDE in a certain domain, and that's all about it. And it has this uh, little drawback that each time you change the parameter setting, you need to do uh, some retraining. On the other hand, we have uh, the, the operator evaluation method, mostly known as the neural operators, where you get to solve uh, uh, different instances of the PDE. So you fix an equation that you want to solve, and then you get multiple training instances, and then the neural network is going to map the, 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 the from map you from the map the parameter space to the solution space. So it has this advantage that once you've trained the neural network to do this mapping, for different instances of the parameter, you need no retraining. You simply just infer the solution. So generally speaking, uh, neural network architectures for PDEs kind of offer an improved cost for, for, for solving the PDEs. But then when you want to look at accuracy, there is still a question as to whether the bit, the finite 11 methods and the finite different methods and so on. But I won't dwell on that now. I just want to give some background of what we are going to be talking about. So uh, I want to highlight here the loss function of the pins and the QRS. So the pins and the QRS have a similar loss function, but then the only difference is usually their, is their architecture. So uh, this is obviously just part of the, new, the, the, the loss function. And the deep reads method, on the other hand, has a different loss function because it doesn't work with the strong formulation of the PDE, but rather works with at minimizing uh, this energy functional in its loss. So instead of having this loss year for the deep, for the deep reads method, we rather have a, a loss year that employs just the first derivative of the solution of the PDE. So this is familiar work uh, in the original Pins paper and uh, the other papers also mentioned here. So on the other hand, we have the neural operator, like the Fourier neural operator as well, which is mostly focused on parameterizing this kernel using different architectures. And we can identify like the Fourier and the Pino that use uh, this Fourier transform in its architect parameterization of the kernel. And uh, the UNET, U Fourier neural operator, which uses a UNET and the Fourier transform, and also the MWT, which is also an interesting neural operator that uses multi wavelet transforms. So of course we have the depot nets and uh, obviously familiar to most of uh, most to the audience I guess and uh, by adding some PD loss to the depot nets you get the physics informed depot nets and yeah just some interesting works mostly by if not all by uh, crunch group also yep so uh, just to describe the methods we use here to solve uh, inverse problems so uh, the first one I want to describe here is the parameter learning method. So you have here the loss function that has a physics loss and say a domain loss for the forward case. But then for the inverse case, since you the interest is to infer this parameter lambda, you can evaluate the function lambda. So the idea is to replace lambda with the neural network, which is going to uh, approximate the solution. So at the end of the day, you get two neural networks, the first one that evaluates the solution to the PD and the second one that infers the the parameter at every point in space and time. And of course, since these, the neural networks are function evaluators, uh, the neural operator cases which map from parameter space to solution space require a different idea. And this idea was also introduced in the, uh, the original PINS paper, though the lambda considered there was uh, just a constant, but we are interested in cases where lambda varies in space and time. 
And another other papers cited here also uh, use a similar idea. So the second one is the backward method, quite common in literature, at least for solving inverse problems, where instead of learning a forward operator from the parameter space to the solution space, we rather learn the inverse operator that takes us from the solution space to the parameter space. And uh, this idea was introduced or was used in the physics informed neural operator uh, for learning paper by uh, Lee and all. And also, this interesting neural architecture, vision informed transformer, in recently in 2023. The second one is uh, the, the third one, rather, is the Tikhonov method, which uh, uh, impressively does not use this backward operator, but uses the forward operator. So you start by learning the forward map from the parameter space to the solution space. And then you use this forward operator to then approximate your parameter lambda. So it's, uh, it's similar to the backward method in that you use a neural operator. But in this case, the neural operator is doing the forward map and not the inverse map. So this, this it's a common method that is used in uh, the inverse uh, uh, problems field, at least for data-driven method, but not so common uh, when you are dealing with PDE-based inverse problems. And of course, the neural networks here are uh, operator evaluators. So this is just an example for what happens when you are dealing with uh, 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 such a scenario for the Tikhonov method. And uh, just to specify here for the uh, PCA-based neural network, so uh, you will first of all need to train the neural network to do the mapping from the parameter, a reduced dimension of the parameter space and the solution space. So you need uh, all these as the input, and then you train your neural network that does this, obviously. And then what happens is that during the, uh, the Tikhonov method, your Tikhonov parameter that you learn represented by lambda here is going to be found at this space, at, the le at this level. And one then needs to uh, do uh, compute uh, lambda or the parameter of interest by applying uh, this function here. OK, so I move here now to the problems that we look at. We start by looking at some very uh, simple problems because the idea was to keep it simple and not just compare what the, 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 the various deep learning methods do in the forward setting, but equally look at what they do in the inverse setting. So for the Poisson equation, we had the parameter lambda and the solution u, and we sampled lambda from uh, a Gaussian random few. And equally, for the Darcy flow problem, we sample lambda from a Gaussian lambda field, similar to that, but a push forward under uh, the transform 2 of 3. And it's a familiar data set in the PDE-based deep learning uh, uh, environment already. So the idea is to obviously map from the solution space to the parameter space, similarly for the Darcy flow problem. So we get back to this later. And the next problem that we looked at was the Helmholtz equation, where we we kick off from you, the solution, the excitation, uh, excitation field, and uh, the frequency uh, uh, omega is kept at 1,000, and the wave speed is sampled from a Gaussian random field as well, pushed forward under a certain function transform given here. So the data set looks kind of like this, and uh, this, data, this, this equation is also uh, considered in this interesting paper uh, from the hoop. Uh, uh, which looks at the cost, uh, cost accuracy trade-off of operator learning. So the next problem that we want to show here is uh, the Navier-Stokes equation, specifically the vorticity stream formulation of the Navier-Stokes uh, equation, uh, inc incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, and it is obtained by a change of variable, which uh, replaces the components of the velocity uh, v with uh, in the continuity and momentum equation with the stream and the formulation. So it makes the equation a little bit uh, uh, simpler compared to the original Navier-Stokes equation. So you kick up from, from a, a Gaussian lamp random field given like this, and we are interested in mapping again from the solution space U and lambda. So of course, again, this is uh, considered also in the cost accuracy trade-off paper, but then the study there is still focusing on the forward problem. So this is just an implementation details for the various uh, experiments we do. And obviously we, we, we try for the pins, the QRS and the PCN and the PCLN. And we also look at the depot net and 
uh, we we use a fully connected neural network and a convolutional neural network for the Poisson and Darcy case, uh, respectively for the branch net. And for the trunk net, we use a, a fit forward neural network. So more details can be found in our paper, but I just get to the results uh, immediately. Okay, so the first thing we observe, at least for the Poisson equation, uh, here are the forward solvers that were used that, that for the forward solvers, and most of them uh, find themselves within a good range, uh, similar range, and the pins, debris, and QRS, which are the function evaluator method, uh, they are kind of above there. So at, at this point, we notice that both the backward methods of of uh, uh, function in a similar way, they have the similar results like the Tikhonov method. And specifically for the top three cases, for the backward method, we obtained that the Fourier neural operator, the physics informed Fourier neural operator and the physics informed deponent kind of perform quite better. And for the Tikhonov method, uh, the Fourier neural operator, multivariate transform and physics informed neural operator perform equally. This is now the inverse problem, right? Yeah, this, this is the inverse problem. We we are focusing on the inverse problem here. The previous uh, figure, uh, the bar chart here, was on the forward problem. OK, just a minute while we, OK, great. So now, uh, one thing we also notice is that though uh, the Fourier neural operator and the Pino, they kind of perform quite well. But then once you look at how they scale with noise, you do realize that these methods scale very poorly with noise. And down here, you notice that the Tikhonov, uh, all the Tikhonov-based methods, which we introduced in this work, uh, kind of scale better with noise. And addition, in addition to this Tikhonov method scaling better with noise, the backward method for the deponent and the backward method for the physics informed deponent equally scale well with noise, which was not the case with the Fourier neural operator neural networks and, and the likes like the Pino and the MWT. For the Darcy flow equation, we equally observe a very similar situation where the, 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 the results or the, 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 the errors, the relative errors stay stays within similar ranges. But then once you want to get a little bit deeper and look at how they scale with noise, you still realize that the Fourier neural operator and its likes, they scale very poorly with noise, with the Pino basically going out of the, the visible graph, as we see here. Why the deponet, the physics informed deponet, uh, uh, and all the Tikhonov based method scale better with noise. A similar observation is made for the Helmholtz equation, and uh, 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 this is still work in progress. That's why here you won't see the physics informed deponent and the deponent yet, but already we kind of have an idea of what to expect from the previous uh, experiment. And again, the Tikhonov based method scale better with noise when compared with the backward method, which uses a neural operator to learn the inverse uh, operator directly. The Navier-Stokes equation that we equally looked at performed similarly, and the observations that we have are still quite the same. And we look forward, obviously, to still continue. Experiments are still ongoing for the deponents and the physics informed deponents so that we can complete this graph just like we did for the Poisson and the Darcy flow problems. So for conclusions, uh, we do realize that deep learning for PDEs uh, uh, and classical, when you compare deep learning for PDEs and classical method, there is a question of cost and accuracy. Accuracy, yes, uh, classical methods have been there for quite a long, so at this level, they do perform uh, better. The deep learning methods are still under development, but when you want to talk about cost, they do perform, they have a better cost than the, the classical method like the finite difference and finite element method. Furthermore, in the inverse settings, one, where you need multiple computations of the forward problem, uh, the deep learning method offers promising results, as we have demonstrated. And specifically, when you use the deep learning based method uh, to you for in the Tikhonov regular and the Tikhonov regularization, you get to obtain uh, better accuracy and it scales better with noise. And some directions that see open, it's we need to investigate why. Uh, how this compares to, you know, classical setting. Remember, our focus here was not just the forward problem, but the inverse uh, problem as well. So it's really interesting to understand how these deep learning-based methods uh, perform when you compare them with 
classical inverse uh, method, this method that use the finite elements and finite different method solvers, or why not even the reduced basis method to solve the PDE, the forward PDE problem. And we've not yet in investigated the behavior of uh, the tikhonov based method in out-of-distribution settings. That is equally an interesting direction that we are looking forward to engaging. And obviously, theory and justification. We need theory, and we need to understand why it performed as it performed, and probably improve it, or know what to do next. So those are the major open directions that we are currently considering as far as uh, solving inverse problems with deep learning uh, methods for PDEs is concerned. So thank you for your attention and uh, year is secure. Can I ask, a, can I ask a, question, a quick question before you go to the next uh, one? Because uh, uh, recently there is a paper by uh, JPL, <clears throat> Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, that they, they do this type of comparison, but they do it in the 3D setting. Oh, okay. Uh, so they do 1D, 2D, and 3D setting. Uh, There's a... a Astrophysicists, actually, we invite them to give a talk here. I forgot, uh, maybe Nazan knows when they will give a talk, but they based their, their conclusion was that, uh, in terms of the cost, for example, that uh, all these methods of deep learning are costly, except in when you go to 3D, the conclusions reverse, at least for the problems that they investigate, I think. But Poisson, for example, and, and it has to do also, of course, with the random sampling and, and so on. For um, So, so um, uh, because we, I've been I've been trying to do this uh, comparison like that. Uh, your comparison is very comprehensive, with Andrew Stewart from Caltech, who is part of the um, FNO mafia, and um, uh, and and um, and and he's insisting on one D, and I insist on three D. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because FNO FNO cannot work at all in three D. It works great in 1D and 2D, but the problem is in 3D, and, and Peter shows some tough 3D problems. Yeah, uh, so for the 3D problems, the main thing is that, for example, CNNs and UNET are not meant for 3D applications to get those convolutional structures running in a 3D setting as a huge overhead. So you have to do some tricks to reduce the 3D structure to some multi-scale approach and learn it from, from low dimensions to high dimensions. If you jump directly to full 3D, it will blow up. Yeah, so, so no, basically what I was going to suggest to Tanya that, to that, that it would be, it would be nice to, to include some 3D comparisons in this very comprehensive study, uh, okay. because you you guys are objective uh, observers if you know we, we do it. And that, that's why I was trying to do this with Andrew. Um, <laughs> we're in the same project actually, but uh, but uh, I think I think it has a lot of value what what you're doing and uh, and uh, so that's all. I, but the, the the paper if you if you Google G R I N N, I think gravity inform gravity inform neural network. Okay. G R I N N. You will see the comparison I'm I was talking about. It was put in the archive recently. Great. Okay. Oh, great. Grin. Yes, we got it. Yeah, great, great. Okay, we're looking forward to the last part also. Uh, I had a question. question. Uh, like this is Valen from Brown. Okay, Yeah, so in your Navia Stokes uh, problem, could you clarify what is that parameter signifying? Uh, a minute. Navier-Stokes equation, uh, am I on the right slide? Yes, so that lambda, what does it signify? Oh, lambda is a forcing term. Okay. Yeah, and that's what we are interested in, in inferring here. Okay, okay, yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, I think we move now to the next talk. I think you should close all the PowerPoints, close all the PowerPoints. So yeah, but I can't uh, do anything. Just a minute, we're figuring out some stuff here. Yeah. Skype first. I've already pressed it. No, oh, yeah, there it is. Oh, no, I. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Can you see my. Nope. Um, oh, no. Not yet. Oh, yes. yes. 
Yes, yes. perfect. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Janek Gödicke and um, I'm also very happy for this opportunity today um, to talk about um, the Torch Physics software of um, our working group, which is a deep learning library for differential equations. For the beginning of um, Torch Physics, we actually need to go back to the year 2021, in which the Robert Bosch GmbH got first interested in physics-informed neural networks, so in PINs. And they wanted to use them in different technical applications. So, for example, in building parts of a car or electronic devices. And a very recent project is the usage in injection molding. This was the reason why they have initiated some a student project in cooperation with our University of Bremen. And um, they wanted to develop a deep learning library, a user friendly deep learning library for partial differential equations. The main developers are also here today. So they are Nick and Nick Heilenkötter and Tom Freudenberg, who are now also um, PhD students at our uh, university. And personally, I joined the Torch Physics team last year when I started my PhD. And my task is mainly about creating exercises and also um, tutorials and also uh, prepare workshops on Torch Physics. The toolbox Torch Physics is publicly available. So there's an, it's an open source library, which you can find on GitHub under the name Bosch Research slash Torch Physics. And as the name Torch Physics already suggests, it's built upon the PyTorch library in Python. So mainly it's using the Autograd functionality for calculating differential operators, but also using the gradient descent schemes. The main goal behind Torch Physics is to be very user-friendly for everyone with a basic mathematical knowledge. So for example, if um, there's a new engineer at the company Bosch uh, who wants to get started with physics-informed deep learning, then it should not take uh, long for him to get started with our library, um, Torch Physics. During the development of Torch Physics, we also um, yeah, took care about fulfilling this um, goal so that now we can say that Torch Physics provides a very clean um, doc documentation of the code bases. And we have also um, uploaded lots of examples and also um, provide detailed tutorials so that it is um, yeah, very easy for the user to get started with um, Torch Physics. Second, Torch Physics um, consists of a very modular um, structure, structure, meaning that there are very so there are some building blocks which provide very disjoint functionalities, uh, which makes it then also easier for the user to extend the code by own features and methods. Last but not least, Torch Physics does also provide a very intuitive way of transferring the mathematical problems into executable code which I also want to um, focus on um, later on in my talk. So here, um, I would like to give a very rough overview of some deep learning methods for differential equations and also explain which of them are already available at Torch Physics. So I divided this method into two main strategies. On the one hand, we have the uh, data-driven approaches. And on the other hand, we have the physics-informed approaches which means that the PDE is directly included into the loss function. So the very first physics-informed method was the PIN approach, so the physics-informed neural networks. But of course, there exists a bunch of uh, different approaches also here. On the data-driven side, I would like to highlight two very famous methods, which, is, uh, which fall under the category of operator learning. On the one hand, there are the Fourier neural operators, FNOs, and on the other hand, um, your deep operator networks, deep O-nets. But of course, there are also exist physics-informed versions of them, so the PINO or the physics-informed deep O-net approach. So what are these uh, methods currently implemented in Torch Physics? You can see them here now in yellow. So for example, it's possible to go for the PIN approach or the deep Ritz method, but also the deep O-net and physics-informed deep O-net approach is available. And um, what can say here that Torch Physics mainly focuses on physics-informed methods, but it's also possible to go for data-driven approaches and also to, to make um, the best out of both worlds to combine data-driven with physics-informed methods. That's also possible. Before I guide you through the main structure of Torch Physics, I thought it might be um, helpful to already have some example in mind, which Torch Physics should be able to tackle. So let's consider a very simple example um, of a PDE here, which is tackled by the PIN approach. 
So let's say we are interested in finding some solution function u, which stores the PDE described by two operators n and b here that represent the um, PDE condition and the boundary condition here. One example would be the Poisson equation, which you can see on the right hand side. So in this case, um, the operator n would just be the Laplacian of u minus some function f. The idea of pins would then be to just uh, sample points within the respective domains and also at the boundary. And in the next step, um, a neural network u theta is trained to minimize the following PDE loss. So the operators n and b are just evaluated at those um, neural network and also these sampled points and are then fed here in this case into um, the mean squared error loss function. So having this example in mind, let us now go over to the basic structure of torch physics. And on this slide here, you can see all the different building blocks of torch physics. So the different um, classes torch physics provide. And in the following, I would like to explain um, the basic functionalities of these classes. At the beginning of everything, there is um, the spaces class. And the spaces class basically represents the mathematical spaces that occur in the formulation of the PDE. So again, if we consider the Poisson equation on the right, here we are dealing with a spatial coordinate x, which comes from a um, two-dimensional space. And furthermore, we are also dealing here with the output space of the function u, which would be one-dimensional here. So in torch physics, we would then just go and define spaces for uh, the variables x and the output variables of the function u. So for example, in case for the spatial variable x, we would here um, in the second line of this code block just define a two-dimensional torch physics space. And the crucial thing about the spaces class is then to just assign names to the variables which come from that space. The advantage of this would be that um, yeah, so the advantage would be that in, uh, in case, so the user does not have to take care about the order in which he feeds points into functions, right? Because touch physics would immediately know whether he is currently dealing with a, temp a time coordinate or with a spatial coordinate or whatever. So this simply reduces the risk of um, doing some mistakes during the implementation, which makes touch physics um, user friendly for the user. But let us have a look at more interesting classes, namely um, the domain class and the point sampler class. So let's first have a look at how flexible um, domains can be created in torch physics. There exists already some pre-implemented uh, basic geometries. For example, it's possible to create a point domain or an interval, but also a triangle, parallelogram, or a circle can be you know, created in torch physics. And then one can just um, create more complex domains by using some logical operators. So given two domains A and B, we simply obtain the union of them by typing A plus B. The set difference is obtained by typing A minus B and the intersection by the logical end operator. Then we can also obtain Cartesian products, so go to higher dimensions. So we can just compute the Cartesian product in torch physics by using the multiplication operator A times B. Next, let us have a look at a very cool and very special feature of torch physics, because in torch physics, a domain A can actually be dependent on a point B, which actually comes, comes from a totally different space, capital B. And if you think now about B just being a time interval, this means that it's possible to create time-dependent domains in torch physics. In the figure, there you can see just in domain A, which is a square with a circular hole in it, and at time point B0, this circular hole is at the um, upper left corner of the domain, whereas till time point B1, this hole has moved to the lower right corner of the domain. And later on in the example, I will also show you how easy it is to create time-dependent domains in torch physics. But here, one last remark on domains. So each torch physics domain also has the property dot boundary, which will return the boundary as a new domain object. So the user does not have to care what the current uh, boundary of the domain would look like. Next, have a, let us have a look at the point sampler class and um, the flexible ways of uh, sampling points within domains and also at the boundary. Here, I'd like to consider just a cylinder as an example and for better visualization, only plotted um, points at the boundary of the cylinder. So in the first row, you see uh, some basic ways 
uh, of sampling points within um, the domain. So for example, it's possible to uh, sample points on a grid equidistantly, but it's also possible to plot points according to some random distribution. More interestingly, in the third picture, you can see it's also possible to plot um, points according to some density function. So here, more points have been sampled, which are close to the floor. In addition to this, it's also possible to go for adaptive sampling strategies. For example, one can uh, sample more points where the current training loss is rather high, which could be desirable in some cases. In the second row, in the last picture, you can see another example of a time-dependent domain. So here we are dealing with a circular plate where some part is missing. And if you think here about the vertical axis just being the time axis, then this is just a circular plate rotating around its center counterclockwise over time. Next, there's also the models class in Torch Physics, where you can basically load any uh, PyTorch model you may have already um, constructed and uh, use it in Torch Physics. But of course, Torch Physics does also provide- Can, can, I, ask, can I ask a question here? Um, yeah. Can you import also STL files in the geometry? Or yes, we also provide um, STL files for, for the geometries, yes. Yeah. Great, thank, thank you. That's a great, uh, yeah, the time depend domains are excellent, great. Yeah, yes. Um, yeah, so uh, here we have also the models class in Torch Physics, uh, where you can load already predefined uh, pre PyTorch models, but there are also pre-implemented architectures uh, available. For example, you can create fully connected or residual networks, but there's also the deep ONet class, which makes it easier for the user to um, yeah, construct some deep ONet architectures in Torch Physics. Uh, furthermore, if you don't only want to solve a PDE, but you would like to uh, tackle some parameter identification problems, so the inverse problem, then it's also possible to include trainable parameters to the models class of Torch Physics. Let us now come to the very heart of uh, the Torch Physics library, which is the conditions class. And um, in the Torch conditions class, we basically collect all the required information so that then in the next step, we can get started with the training procedure. Depending on the method you would like to go for, there exist different types of Torch physics conditions. So for example, if you would like to go for uh, the pin approach, you just define pin conditions in Torch physics. Typically for each mathematical condition that occur in the formulation of the PDE, you would need to create a separate torch physics condition, so a pin condition here. So here again, let's consider the Poisson equation. Here we are uh, dealing with two mathematical conditions, so we would need to create two pin conditions here in this example. So let me illustrate how easy it is to create those conditions in torch physics. So let us consider the um, PDE condition here with the Laplacian in it. So the first step would always be to create some residual function, which you can see here in the first two lines of code. And here we just compute then the, the Laplacian of u with respect to x and minus f, right? And this Laplacian is already provided by the differential operators that are pre-implemented in Torch physics. Then we are almost done. We will then just create this pin condition for the PDE condition by uh, with three inputs. So we first need to specify the neural network, which should fulfill this condition. Then we also need some point sampler, which provides points within this respective domain. And lastly, we also need to include the residual function we have just created. Here you can see some more conditions which are available in Torch Physics. So for example, it's possible also to um, go for a data-driven approach. For this purpose, we have the data condition available. And it's also possible um, to go for the deep ONet approach and physics informed deep ONet approach. So there are also conditions for um, these uh, purposes. At the end, there's also the solver class of Torch Physics. So here, basically, all conditions we have previously defined are collected so that here we can then finally um, compute the overall loss function and not only the partly loss functions. Furthermore, we can also specify here the optimization algorithm we would like to apply. So for example, the ADAM or the LBFGS algorithm. The solver class is built upon the PyTorch Lightning library. So we can also benefit from very nice features um, of the PyTorch Lightning library here. One example would be that it's possible to monitor the um, individual losses corresponding to all of the different uh, conditions we have defined. 
So we could check whether the where the most uh, the largest problems come from, rather from the boundary initial conditions or whatever. With this, I would like to end my introduction to the structure of torch physics. And I think now it's time to have a look at some example. So here I'd like to consider an example of a PDE with a time-dependent domain, which is tackled by the pin approach in torch physics. This example has been considered by my colleagues, which are who are all here today. So by Nick, Tom, and Derek. So the paper you can see here in the footnote. And this example came up in correspondence with uh, the company Bosch, uh, where they wanted to consider a simplified uh, model of the internal part of an electrical motor. The basic setting you can see on the right. There you can see a circular box, which is filled with some fluid. And within this fluid, there you can see a bar, which um, basically heats up over time and then also rotates around its center. Here you can see a bunch of equations that has been considered during um, the modeling. And uh, the very first one you can see here, the first line is the Navier-Stokes equation for incompressible fluids. And in the third line, you can see also that the time-dependent uh, heat equation has been involved over here. But I don't want uh, to go into too much detail about the modeling here, because I would like to focus on the implementation in torch physics. So the question is, how can we actually define now the time-dependent domain in torch physics? So what is actually time-dependent here is, of course, the rotating bar. So the first step would then be to just create the rotating bar. And the bar is, of course, some uh, parallelogram. And uh, a parallelogram is uniquely determined by three of its corner points. So the first step would be just to create time-dependent um, functions for the position of these corner corners. So this you can see in the first two lines here of this code block. Here we defined the uh, co first corner as a function of the time uh, input t. And it just returns the rotation matrix at this time t times the start position of this corner. And um, then we can just go and create the bar in touch physics as a parallelogram domain, which gets then these three corner functions we have defined as an input, which you can see here in the fourth line of code. And that's it. By this, we have already created the time-dependent bar in torch physics. We can then just go on and define the final domain by first defining the circular domain in torch physics. And then in the last step, we obtain um, the om uh, domain omega, where the fluid is inside by uh, just taking the difference of the circle and the bar. Oh. Um, now it should work again? No. Why has it changed? Oh, no, no, Sorry, your mouse is on the screen. Your mouse is not on. No. Oh, no. <laughs> sorry. I'm very sorry. We have two splitted screens here, and now I can't go back to my usual screen. Uh, I will share my screen again. I'm very sorry. Mm. Maybe if you can get out of the presentation mode, maybe easier. I think now it should work again. Yes. So, yeah, uh, I, I want also to show you um, the reconstructions we made in torch, uh, in torch physics. So in a second, I will show you an animation of the temperature distribution over time within the fluid. So let me start the animation over here. So you can see that um, the temperature um, yeah, distributes throughout uh, the fluid, and it's coming from the rotating bar. So on first glance, the reconstruction uh, looks quite reasonable. Unfortunately, we don't have access yet to any comparisons with uh, classical methods. The Bosch company is um, currently working also on providing some comparisons by the finite element method and also by with the finite difference methods. But uh, yeah, we are waiting for uh, their work here at this point. At the end of my talk, in the last part, I would also draw some like to draw some comparison to other Python libraries. And I would like to focus on those who are also open source and who also implement physics-informed deep learning. The first library I'd like to consider here is the DeepXDE library, which um, yeah, all of you are probably already familiar of, because um, this has been developed by Lu Lu and supervised by George Kaniadakis at the Brown University. And this software is also available on GitHub, like Torch Physics is also. 
Second, there is the NVIDIA Modulus um, library, which has been developed by the NVIDIA Corporation. And also this one is freely available on GitHub. As a first comparison, I would like to give some uh, general, general information about these libraries. So Torch Physics and Modulus are both based on the PyTorch library, whereas DeepXDE has mainly been developed on TensorFlow, but it now does also provide um, a support to PyTorch, JAX, and the Pedal Pedal library. Um, all of these libraries have in common that they are pip installable, which makes it then easier for the users to um, get the installation done. Furthermore, all uh, share a very similar structure, so it consists of similar building blocks. For example, they provide domain classes or condition classes. However, they you, may use... Yeah? Can you hear me? Sorry? Okay, okay ah. continue. Yes, okay. Um, However, they um, yeah, use some slightly different names for them. So for example, the domain class in um, Torch Physics would correspond to the geometry class of uh, DeepXDE. Next, let us have a look at the flexibility of um, how domains can be created and points can be sampled within these domains. All of these libraries provide very basic domain operations like um, computing the union, intersection, and set difference of two domains. And in addition to this, Torch Physics also provides the Cartesian product as a feature. And the very um, special thing about Torch Physics is that it is um, possible to create also easily time-dependent domains over here. Then, as we have already said now, um, Torch Physics, but also Modulus provides STL geometry. So it's also possible to um, use a surface triangulation language over here. Regarding the sampling, um, all of these libraries provide very basic sampling approaches, for example, sampling on a grid or using um, random sampling uh, strategies. And in addition to this, in Torch Physics and also Modulus, it's possible to go for adaptive sampling strategies, which means that more points are sampled um, according to the current training loss. So one can conclude here that the very strengths of Torch Physics is its flexibility in creating domains and sampling points within these domains. As a last comparison, I would also like to have a look at the diversity of pre-implemented methods of those libraries. And all of these libraries provide the um, very basic pin approach, but I would like to highlight here that DeepXDE also um, provide lots of extensions of this and also um, some improvements of the pin approach, which are already available. Um, then also these libraries all provide the a basic deep ONET approach and physics informed deep ONET approach, but also here the deep XDE library um, provides uh, lots of extensions of the deep ONET approach. One example would be the Fourier deep ONET approach, which is a bit similar to the Fourier neural operators because it also makes use of the Fourier transform over here. In addition to this, the modulus um, uh, library also provides neural operators and the physics informed um, general neural operator approach. But one can say here that um, DeepXDE uh, yeah, provides lots of extensions of all the um, implemented methods, and both DeepXDE and modulus um, yeah, provide a lot, large variety of different approaches. With this, I would like to come to a summary of what we heard today about Torch Physics. So Torch Physics is a very user-friendly software where it's easy to get started with because of uh, lots of examples, tutorials, um, which we provide, and also the code documentation. Furthermore, um, Torch Physics provides very flexible ways of creating domains and also sampling points within these. And last but not least, it is built out of um, very decoupled modules, which makes it easily extendable by the user with own features and methods. Currently and in the future, we will also work on um, providing further methods. So for example, we are working on implementing fully neural operators and also the hidden physics model. And of course, we would also like to upload more examples for all of the different implemented methods. So if uh, somebody wants to make some contributions to our library, of course, uh, we would always be open for this. So um, yeah, just let us know. Uh, uh, we would uh, be very happy about that. One last thing I would like to mention over here is some upcoming workshop about Torch Physics. Actually, we have already had two workshops uh, this mm -hmm. summer. One has been at the Bremen University and the other one at the Technical University of Hamburg, which is also in uh, Germany. 
And the next workshop, which is upcoming, will be at the 7th and the 8th of November, and it will take place at the Heidelberg University of Germany. And it's also possible to participate online at this workshop. The organizers are on the one hand us and also the Bosch um, company of Stuttgart, and there are still some places left. So if you're interested here, you can also see a QR code, which should directly um, link you to uh, the website of our workshop. With this, I would like to say uh, thank you for your attention. And of course, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, yeah. A big thank you to our speakers for their great presentation. Now we would like to open the floor for questions from the audience. Is there any question? I think George wanted to... Well, let me ask people, uh, other people first. I will ask thank last. You. Hi, hi, Anik. This is Raj from Brown. Uh, uh, hi. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, um, uh, do you do you use Torch functional API under the hood or just Torch API? Uh, Torch functional. Sorry? Torch functional API. Um, what do you mean exactly by Torch functionality? So, so there are for there are two implementation for like automatic gradient and the uh, JVP and VJP. So. This, uh, this automatic differentiation is provided to functional APIs, like they are faster than torch.autograd. So what uh, what API you use under the hood for automatic differentiation? Yeah, so the developers are also here, so I can give the word to, to them. Service. Yeah, we are still using Autograd, but we are, we came interested in the, the new and faster features, especially for the deep owner implementation because this could make the, the implementation of the gradients for the deep owner easier. So we are we already had a look on that and are interested in maybe maybe switching at least part of the backend, but currently we use the standard auto world framework. Yeah. So your experience, Nicolas, is that it really is worthwhile changing the differentiation routine? Because Autograd doesn't use lazy evaluation. It's like it's still matrix based. So that's why. It's slightly slow for like if you go for high dimensional and all the high dimension or high dimensional PD. So okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Also, just one comment. Uh, DeepXD have uh, this software have the adaptive refinement. It is called Rare. So you can refine the point, uh, the res residual adaptive refinement in DeepXD as well. So in your comparison table, I think. And that was that it was in the of, tutorial it, that was yeah. in the tutorial the siam review also paper yeah yeah so uh, yeah, yeah, like deep XD, yeah deep xd you can also like use the adaptive refinement of the shelf so okay nice yeah thanks so do you mean that it's possible to sample points according to the current loss or yes uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah on yeah. the basis of residual yes yes okay perfect Cool. Yeah, so yeah, it was even in the first implementation, also it was there, the first paper which came out from the, the group. So mm -hmm. let yeah. me follow up on uh, Raj on two on two points. One is uh, the high dimensions. I don't know if you've seen a paper, but now pins could solve uh, let's say Hamilton Jacobi Bellman, all all equations actually PD is in one hundred thousand dimensions using something we introduced is called stochastic dimension graded descent mm -hmm. very very simple concept you just do mini budget in dimensionality and uh, it can it can work with any dimensionality so i think that's a a great feature to have in your in your library we don't have it in uh, lulu didn't put in the deep xd first so so you can have breaking rights if you do it first but, <laughs> but it, it, it is it is uh it is on uh the papers on the web and it works really great uh any dimension any equation without sampling uh, and uh, uh, but 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 in, that's why Raj also talked about um, uh, how you can do the derivatives efficiently in, um, in high dimensions uh, using a, not the reverse mode. But uh, another another question, I, not question, but I, I kind of like a request, and I was very pleased to see the um, this presentation. Um, Raj and I are teaching a course. Uh, for uh, NVIDIA. In fact, NVIDIA will release uh, in the, during the supercomputer conference, they will announce this course we developed for them. It's called Deep Learning for Scientists and Engineers. And um, it goes through all the basics. I also teach the course here, but at the end, 
uh, we have a um, lecture on two lectures, right? There are two lectures on modulus. Yes, yes, yeah. By one NVIDIA. Is one is but yeah, yeah. It, it's by NVIDIA, actually. And there is another lecture by Lulu on DeepXD. And it would be great to also host you um, for the next for the next release. I think the first release probably is too late. But the next release of... Uh, so NVIDIA will have this on their website. The course will be free for um, all the universities, uh, all, all educational institutes. So... so uh, I would uh, like to invite you to contribute to Torch uh, uh, to your library um, in that course. I think it will add. Uh, it will give a lot of visibility to the library, but also you can get a lot of good feedback. I think. Yeah. Uh, so if, if you are, are interested, I can, we can Raj and I can send you the details, and we can tell you we can send you also what we have for DeepXD and uh, modules, and you can see. Um, Basically, you prepare a um, about a hundred slides or less with demos, plus um, uh, you record. You will uh, record uh, uh, for each uh, for each slide. So it's fun. Uh, we spent two years doing it with Raj. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great, George. Thank you very much. So we will we will we will follow your example and please do send us a link, and we are happy to join whenever it's it's ready for it. I I think I was really privileged to to attend this course at the, the summer school you presented part of the slide in Stockholm. the slides in Stockholm, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. In Stockholm it was a mini a mini version of that. Yeah, yeah. you're right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, we put we put the papers that have been mentioned and you can go to the link and archive, preprint and read the papers. Also I, I remember Nicholas, do you have any questions? I think you want to ask questions? Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is okay, Nicholas. I'm a, a PhD student at Johns Hopkins. Uh, I, I was wondering, instead of the uh, adaptive sampling, if like you have thought or you have like an adaptive subsampling, if, if we have a lot of data, but we haven't sampled well, like. Uh, we, so we've, for, for a sample point, we've also used adaptive subsampling schemes. So I think they're actually, Two different adaptive sampling schemes, and one is based on on simply subsampling the existing data. Mm -hmm. uh, it's currently not not meant for working with existing data, but uh, yeah, that's of course another use case. Yeah, thank you. So, is there any question for the speakers? I think there is no other question, so we can conclude this session. Uh, you can stay in the seminar. We have a next uh, session, the second session. Uh, and let me... Thanks, Peter, thank, thank you very much, and uh, we'll keep in touch. It was, yeah. it was a great presentation. Yeah, thank you, George. We are honored. Bye-bye. Uh, you're, you're welcome thank to you so any of you to, to stop by here in time. We're also a big group, so... We welcome visitors every day. Ah, perfect. We will come back to you. So without further delay, let's move on to the next session. Uh, Professor Hu and Peng Tao, which of you want to share the screen? Yeah, I will. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you share uh, your I'm screen to right see now? if there is any problem? Oh. Uh, yeah, can you see my screen? Yes. And do, yeah. Yes. So, two speakers will be giving a talk about analysis and application of pins for two phase interface problems. And let's begin by introducing a speakers for this session. Uh, the first speaker is Professor Peng Tao Son, is a full professor of Department of Mathematical Science in University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, Dr. Son obtained his PhD degree from Institute of Mathematics, uh, Chinese Academy of Science in 1997 before joining uh, 
the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. In uh, 2007, he worked as postdoctoral fellow, uh, research associate and assistant professor in Hong Kong Polytechnic University, Pennsylvania State University, and Simon Fraser University. Dr. Sun's uh, primary research fields are uh, numerical PDs and scientific and engineering computing with application to um, miscellaneous uh, multi-physics problem in the fields of solid mechanics, uh, fluid dynamics, um, fuel, cell, uh, fuel cell dynamics, fluid structure uh, interactions, uh, hemodynamics, electrohydrodynamics, and so on. Dr. Sun has been continuously supported by National Science Foundation, NSF, Simon uh, Foundation and Faculty Opportunity Awards uh, at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas since 2008. Uh, and he was the recipient of Distinguished uh, Research Award at College of Science, uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, and the second speaker is Professor Hu who is an associate professor in the Department of Mathematics at Tufts University. He received his PhD in computational mathematics from uh, Jiajian University in 2009. He conducted a year of postdoctoral research at the Beijing uh, International Center of Mathematics Research and then became, uh, and then became a postdoctoral, uh, postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Mathematics at Pennsylvania State University in uh, 2010. He served in the position of a research assistant professor at Penn State before joining TOFS in uh, 2014 and whose uh, primary research interests uh, are in numerical analysis and scientific computing with an emphasis on the development, analysis, and implementation of numerical algorithms for solving partial differential equations. Um, his algorithms have been used by commercial companies such as NVIDIA, China National Offshore Oil Company, and PetroChina in 2016. His work received the uh, Ryman Liovel Award at the International Conference on Fractional Differential and its applications, and his algorithm won the best uh, performer of uh, disease module identification dream challenges. He was a plenary speaker at the 24th International Conference on Domain Decompos uh, Decomposition Methods in 2017 and 13th International Conference on Larger Scale uh, Scientific Computations in 2021. Uh, also, his research has been supported by the U.S. Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. So, Professor Peng Tao or Professor Hu, I don't know who are who is the first speaker, yeah. but you you can start the talk. Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, doctor. Uh, yeah, Peng Tao, thanks to me. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm talking right now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's our big big honor. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say some thanks for word uh, on behalf of Dr. Xiao Zhou Hu, uh, who is right there now. Uh, will, he will later talk about this uh, 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 following my uh, uh, slides. So I am first want to uh, uh, thank uh, Dr. Kanyadakis. A uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very nice uh, invitation to invite us to give a talk in your, sem in your seminar. So our big honor. So. Yeah, so let's let me get into the talk right now since we have a little bit <laughs> fifteen minutes late. Okay, I, I'm, I'm we are trying to finish up our talk uh, in uh, in fifteen minutes, right? Fifteen minutes, right? Or forty five? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have about forty five minutes, and we can okay. Okay. keep. Yeah, all right, yeah, professor, take your time. We we don't have a strict limit time limitation, yeah. so oh, all you, right. you don't have to be yeah. in a hurry. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let me start. So uh, the topic uh, which I'm going to talk about today, I, I changed a little bit from the two phase flow to the uh, to be more focused uh, flow structure interaction problem FSI. So which also one of the two problems we did in our recently uh, accepted paper by uh, FISC. Uh, thanks to uh, George uh, help. So uh, we are going to uh, talk about this uh, topic today. Uh, the outline of our talk is to uh, uh, it following. Okay, first of all, I want to in, uh, introduce what the FSI uh, is, uh, and the general uh, interface problem looks like what. So, 
uh, that's because I can, we are going to solve this problem using uh, deep learning, a uh, deep neural network, uh, deep, deep, uh, those deep, deep learning uh, uh, approach uh, to solve this problem. And the second one, uh, as a comparison purpose, I'm, I'm going to uh, give a, a quick review about traditional financial method to solve a FSR problem with the moving uh, interface. I uh, just compared, uh, compared to the uh, mesh, mesh free method which is a deep neural network, which is gonna be the third, uh, next topic. Uh, I and, and, and Xiaojie are gonna talk about this uh, uh, main, to, uh, main point together. So I'm going to talk about the methodology setup and the numerical experiment for using a DNA method uh, in the PINs approach uh, for solving FSI with a stationary interface problem. Uh, please pick, uh, pay attention to this. The interface will be, uh, a stationary uh, compared to the traditional method for moving method by a uh, moving interface uh, of uh, FSI. So, and shall just gonna talk about theoretical analysis uh, following my uh, slides. And uh, finally conclude. Okay, let's start. So first of all, I'm gonna introduce some uh, scenarios of, of FSI problem in practice. So first of all, the uh, hemodynamic is the first application of uh, FSI. So I, I remember I, I I attended one seminar given by George uh, in Beijing a um, couple of years ago, uh, several years ago, actually. And I know George also did a lot of uh, hypodynamic before uh, using FSI. So this is what we did. I, 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 I worked with my former uh, postdoc supervisor, Jin Chao Xu, at Penn State before. And uh, later in my university, I also worked with uh, uh, Jin Chao and even uh, Xiao Zhe also when, when he was at, at Penn State. We worked together on these problems. So this is a cardio a cardiovascular disease problem. So heart pump can uh, replace the failure. Uh, if fa uh, failed heart, I can use, we can use heart pump to uh, to 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 kill the, the problem of a heart. And this is a uh, uh, by the way, this is an aneurysm uh, of one of the uh, important uh, CVD uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. So this is another uh, kind of uh, surgery process I'm, I'm, I was trying to simulate using stent, invasive stent, uh, try to simulate. So all of them tell you uh, the, the hemodynamic is the, the one of the first, most important application of FSI. And the second application of FSI uh, is hydrodynamic. That's, our, that's also our starting point to learn and, and study uh, FSI problem back to, uh, actually back to 10 years ago. So we started with a hydrodynamic problem in FSI. This is a hydro turbine uh, uh, impacted by the, the incoming flow, uh, make that rotating, then uh, uh, generate the electricity uh, by linking to the generator. And this is the application, uh, that's the uh, simulation result uh, by our uh, element method using LE. So later I'm gonna review that part quickly. And the next application uh, scenario of FSI would be aerodynamic. Uh, aerodynamic problem like a jet engine. Uh, this is uh, the most uh, difficult uh, problem uh, in FSI because both fluid and structure would be compressible, also combining with thermodynamic more dynamic scenario. Uh, so that's most important, also most difficult part. So we haven't done anything about this field yet, but we did some other application for the high mall and the hydrodynamic already. So, okay, uh, in, from this slide, I'm gonna give you a quick review about uh, what we did and what we have learned so far and uh, using traditional financial method to solve FSI problem. So first uh, method, uh, I mean, talk about interface fitted mesh method. Okay, please uh, notice the mesh method. Okay, mesh is always, um, always the first thing to, to be done for, for using tra traditional numerical method. Uh, not only just to find element, find difference, find volume, always use mesh, right? So this, this you can see uh, uh, AOE method is, uh, 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 is the first representing method in this field. So we always get a moving mesh by introducing uh, AOE mapping, um, where AOE mapping gonna be equal to the uh, structure displacement on the interface. Which, when the interface of which interface also are uh, the surface of a structure, when the when considering the uh, immersed case of uh, FSI, 
then uh, the, the, the method, uh, the, the mesh is going to be moving along with the rotating or, or moving or deforming uh, structure. And then using that LE, uh, we got LE mapping variable, we're going to, uh, we're going to modify the fluid structure, uh, fluid dynamic equation. Usually we use the Navier-Stahl equation uh, to make that, uh, to make the material derivative become LE based the material derivative with the relative uh, velocity as a, velo as a convection term. So that's the modification of uh, uh, navier docks uh, based on the LE method. So by the way, I just quickly give you the, uh, the, the, the key point in this method and no more other. Uh, and the next method uh, in this field called interface unfitted mesh method. Again, mesh will be used uh, in this field as well, but the, the two mesh going to be overlapped together. The background mesh called fluid mesh. So we're gonna use we're gonna send the fluid into the structure to get the entire domain occupied by the whole fluid, but uh, the the full inside structure domain will be considered as a, a fictitious fluid whose velocity equal to the uh, structure velocity uh, by some by weakly or strongly uh, uh, different way may have different uh, numerical method. But overall, we should consider the uh, interpolation between the two mesh. Uh, we're going to do the interpolation from a fluid mesh to the structure mesh based on the uh, the mesh uh, quality. So we still rely on the mesh. So any method here in, in traditional uh, numerical approach always start with the mesh. And uh, and one more thing uh, below uh, be, uh, belong to this uh, interface unfitted is called the cut element method. Uh, for example, X fan or uh, uh, I fan or uh, interface fan, fan element or extended fan element all belong to this. Uh, this field, but uh, this cut element method need to find out the intersection point between the two mesh, even more complicated, <clears throat> especially in high dimension. Uh, you, you can imagine how difficult you can find out two mesh in different, uh, two mesh uh, interpolation, uh, uh, intersection point between two mesh in high dimension. So that's all an, an, another challenge uh, in this field. So, uh, yeah, uh, using this slide, I'll quickly show you uh, uh, my recent work with uh, Jin Chao and my group uh, using this uh, fictitious domain method to solve the problem, uh, which is the separation of a tumor cell from a, a blood cell uh, using this uh, well de well designed device, which we call micro uh, chip uh, device, uh, where we have lots of uh, uh, obstacle. Uh, Pillar, pillar array, uh, which is inclined, inclined angle and uh, a certain certain pattern to be uh, attributed. So the cell will be separated eventually following the flow, uh, following the fluid flow, a uh, uh, streamline. Uh, some 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 cell go, go to uh, go, go out from here. Some cell yeah go out from here. So bigger cell gonna go go out from the uh, upper upper right corner and the some hollow one gonna go up. From here, so that means separation of cell. Uh, and uh, yeah, this uh, here, I, I don't want to get into detail for this method. So uh, we need uh, again, we need a mesh, right? We need a mesh. We need we need two uh, overlapping mesh together. So this is the real. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. This is the real uh, uh, real uh, simulation using the the real device designed by uh, our uh, collaborator from a bioengineering company. So they did this. Okay, just a quick review. So let's back to uh, our current uh, main topic today uh, for the mesh-free method using the deep neural network approach implemented by PIMS, uh, developed by uh, George Group, uh, especially I know the Lulu is the main uh, uh, inventor in that, uh, for that package, uh, PDE, XD, uh, P, uh, P, uh, DN, XD, XPD, right? I remember that. Okay, this I'm gonna uh, introduce a little bit about that. So uh, this talk is going to be based on our recently accepted paper by CISC, uh, Physics Informed Neural Network Method for Dynamic Two-Phase Infinite Problem. In that paper, uh, we, we studied two problems. Um, FSI is one of them. So today I'm going to focus on FSI, uh, mainly for them, that second problem, FSI. Uh, since uh, we our talk talk about the key point, of, uh, talk, about, uh, talk, about, talk about something new, right? So the, this slide just to tell you the uh, the common fully connected feed-forward deep neural network structure. So I'm gonna skip this. 
everybody knows this structure. So we don't uh, invent a new structure of BNN, but just use it uh, to solve our problem. So this slide, we got, I'm going to uh, just first set up a general model of FSI using operators. That's also what we did in our paper, because we try to use a, a, a unified model uh, description to, uh, to, to model two different uh, two different problems. One is the two-fifth loop, the other one FSI. So this one just for FSI. So you can see uh, this, uh, the L, the operator L, uh, L1 means uh, fluid equation, L2 means solid equation, uh, gamma one is interface condition, this boundary can be uh, B1, B2, a boundary condition of two problem, fluid and, and structure. And the last one, initial condition, we have two. Uh, we have two initial can always have two. One is uh, a continuity of a velocity, second one continuity of uh, of uh, uh, flux, uh, flux cross the interface, cross the interface. Okay, uh, uh, just, just based on the pin structure, uh, pin uh, structure, so we always start with the least square formulation to solve uh, the strong, to solve the strong form for the uh, variables. So by using least square, we can define the two to the loss function as this. Uh, so each, each, uh, each differential operator actually means the residual, right? This is the residual of a gamma equation inside the domain. This is the residual of a interface condition on the on the, on the interface, uh, which is a new one, a new term uh, compared to the single domain problem without interface. And other other remaining terms, the boundary term and the initial term are the same with what you guys used before. Uh, only this term is new to, uh, to our problem. But this term doesn't need more uh, technique uh, to, uh, to analyze and solve it. And then we minimize this uh, uh, two-to loss function uh, with, uh, based on some proper Hilbert space, uh, V1, V2, based on, uh, belong to different subdomain, o omega 1, which means now fluid domain, omega 2, which means now a structure domain. And now, theoretically, we can use a different DNA structure to approximate each variable in different subdomain, like uh, uh, I use, we use capital U sub one sub n n uh, super one to mean to, to approximate uh, the first uh, sub problem, which is uh, which is now fluid fluid equation. For for example, it is fluid for velocity u one, and uh, use the second uh, DNA approach a uh, DNA uh, DN structure to approximate the second uh, sub sub, uh, sub problem defined in, in the second domain, which is now structure domain. We can consider u two is a, a structure displacement. Uh, for, uh, just something like that. And based on this uh, uh, space-time uh, training set, where the training set is, uh, is defined by both spatial, uh, uh, spatial and temporal, um, temporal point, uh, sampling point set, uh, Xi. Also, we use, we, we just first of all, we, uh, we, we, we triangulate, like we triangulate the entire D, uh, D plus one domain, space-time domain uh, at, at once. Then we locate uh, those uh, subdomains, uh, uh, sample point, uh, by 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 finding out what what sample uh, sample located inside what subdomain. So we then got XI using them to training to train each sub uh, sub problem. But uh, we do this way uh, in monolithic way and uh, not partitional. Uh, monolithic means uh, you know entirely. Uh, inter in, in, interaction between each uh, subdomain, not uh, separate uh, solve them, solve each, each subdomain, but just uh, uh, put them together. Okay, this is our entire uh, FSI loss function. Uh, the, the, the breakdown, the breakdown. So uh, uh, later, Xiao Zhe can talk about more, de more detail about this uh, form, but here you can see, you can use the weight. Uh, omega means each omega just the weight function. Uh, or maybe constant. So depending on the which way you can see this, the first one is uh, omega i f. That's the initial part, the initial part. And the second, okay, uh, second one l f, uh, which uh, which means uh, the fluid uh, governing equation in the interior domain. Uh, omega uh, l f. That's the structure uh, governing equation, the residual in uh, actually here the uh, least uh, least square form, right? In, in the in interior domain. And the boundary boundary term goes to this this line, uh, B F B F B F, and the gamma term. Uh, okay, that means uh, uh, inter uh, interface condition 
uh, L LF uh, V squared term of uh, inner condition. So we add them up uh, to get the entire total uh, loss function for FS. Okay, I want to uh, emphasize the two terms. These two terms actually don't belong to the strong form, but uh, from our uh, uh, from our analysis part. So uh, Xiaozhi later is going to talk about this too, why we have these two terms and how do we uh, uh, conquer these two terms? Uh, how do we solve the entire uh, loss function using these two terms? Although they don't belong to a strong form. Usually, you know, pins. Uh, pins method, usually we only solve the, uh, uh, solve the least square form of a strong form from the governing equation. So, but these two terms don't belong to strong form. How, uh, how we get that? So later it is from the, uh, uh, from our analysis part. So you will see that. So that's too also important to give us a final uh, theoretical result later on. Okay, uh, <clears throat> that's all in for the continuous level of uh, minimization problem. Now we're gonna use this uh, two structure, being structure to uh, um, approximate each uh, variable, which means fluid velocity, for example, and structure displacement. Actually, we also have a fluid uh, a pressure here. Huh? I don't write that in general, but this is for the general uh, framework. And then uh, based on this, uh, um, this, this square problem, we're gonna find out the minimization of this discretized uh, LS problem, where each of these uh, this, uh, terms called the mean square errors uh, discretized by a quadrature, uh, because we can use quadrature, numerical quadrature to discretize each uh, L2, in, uh, L2 in a product. Uh, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's call continue, we call discretization. And the input layer, because we have a lot of uh, heating layer inside, but uh, uh, on the left, the input layer that's meant from the D plus one dimension, uh, D, D, D dimensional space, uh, space and one dimensional uh, time. So we've got D plus one, and outer layer is formed by, uh, uh, by variables. Uh, Ping Tao, I have a question. Ping Tao, I yes. have a question. So. Yes, so you don't use the quadrature is on a lattice or is it on uh or you do Monte Carlo some uh, quant quadrature? Yes, Monte Carlo, yes. Okay, so you don't introduce a grid to do the you do the quadrature using Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo, yes, Monte Carlo. That's because we have the mean mean, mean square error. This I'm gonna give you that that uh, yeah, right now in this slide, we just uh, the mean square error defined by by this uh, form. That's that's obviously Monte Carlo, yeah, Monte Carlo quadrature. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, let me start, let, let me continue. So uh, the term I just emphasized here, that's a, a corresponding to the, that term I just said earlier, uh, in the continuous level, which actually called the initial stress term uh, from the structure. Uh, all the rest are similar, just uh, discretization of the L2 inner product using the color quadrature. Uh, and uh, this for the, uh, uh, yeah, this, this term, especially, uh, that is uh, uh, mean, a mean square error of uh, uh, structure velocity on the boundary. Actually, we don't need that in the strong form, but we do need that in our analysis. That's why we put that here to get our final result, uh, final theoretical result later on. Uh, our final theoretical result, the main result kind of based on these two assumptions. For the, for the assumption, uh, just like, uh, um, we assume uh, we assume all those differential operators are inversible and they are elliptic continuous. We have this assumption first. We're gonna use this assumption to, to conduct our analysis. Second assumption just we assume all the quadrature we employed here has the convergent rate up to F order, uh, F order. Uh, capital A here means the number of uh, uh, sample points, uh, sample points. That's also doable, right? So for example, when, right now we use a Monte Carlo quadrature rule here, alpha would be one half, that would be one half. Okay, based on those two assumptions, we have this, our main result here for, uh, in this theorem, uh, where E, uh, e sub F super V, that's the error of uh, fluid velocity, EFP means uh, error of uh, our fluid pressure, and EFU, that's the error of uh, structure displacement. Okay, uh, on the left, you see uh, that's the give us uh, the L2, L2, right? So L2 is uh, in, in time and also L2 is the base of uh, uh, error of uh, fluid, fluid velocity, error of uh, uh, structure velocity. Also, we have the, even we even have H1 of uh, velocity of uh, 
uh, structure as well. So we have this uh, a stress term of the stress on the left-hand side as well. And uh, on the right-hand side, we have two parts uh, to, 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 to bond, this, uh, uh, bond those errors. First of all, we have minimization errors uh, given by those uh, differential uh, operate, uh, residual differential operator on those op optimizer theta star, which our optimizer found out after the minimization. Second error source is from quadrature error, error uh, which have a C sub quad. That quadrature error, uh, based on the second assumption, we have that just now. Uh, those, uh, this, this result is going to be, okay, I think, okay, I think. Uh, uh, not right now, Xiaozhi can take over from here to give you more detail about how we get this theorem. So Xiaozhi? Yeah, let me share my screen. Uh, should I stop? Yeah. All right. So can you guys see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so um, let me explain a little bit more how we uh, get the, uh, the, the error analysis for the FSI problem. Uh, let me go back a little bit. Um, uh, start from the 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 general framework, the theoretical framework we we developed. It's based on the um like Minero and uh, uh what's the other author's name? I forgot. Um, uh, based on the, their results published in two thousand twenty two or twenty three. I don't remember exactly, but it's the same idea. Basically, we have assumption on the PDs as Matt Penton mentioned, which sort of we have like inver uh, the operate inverse of the operators uh a bond in certain sense. But to, to use this, the way we use that is we keep those U's as the solution, uh, UI as the exact solution, but the VIs are replaced by the U, uh, the, the neural network solution approximations. Then this becomes the error term. Uh, then those uh, those terms here become zero. That's how we set our problem. That's just the exact solution is to identify the PDEs. So those operators here become zero. So what you left is these terms uh, which is sort of basically give you the residual term um, 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 when you plug in the VI as the, uh, plug in the, um, uh, you know, the neural network approximations as VIs. Once you have that, then you apply the quadrature assumption, quadrature rules here, apply on each residual term, then we end up with this, um, the abstract error, as, uh, error analysis here. Now for the FSI problem we're looking at, uh, so let me um, repeat the slides that I already showed. This is basically the, the FSI problem we're looking at. Um, other things are not, uh, you know, other things are not that interesting. What I want to emphasize is one is the boundary condition here, which usually when we assign the boundary condition, this is like sort of a traditional boundary condition for the structure equation on the boundary. And the other one is the initial condition for the for the structure, which is also uh, just assign the, um, the, 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 the values uh, of the function, the structure, uh, the solution on the, uh, at the initial time. Um, so now to apply that uh, analysis, what we need to do is uh, we first look at define errors as what uh, Penton mentioned. Then we can define residuals. Uh, it's residuals defined basically as uh, uh, it's the same. It's the PD operator apply on the on the error, roughly speaking. So you have all these residuals. They are nothing but um, basically negative of those of those operators we introduced before. So that's um, uh, that's standard. Uh, I also I still want to emphasize that for the uh, residuals on the for the structure equation on the boundary, this is just the error of the uh, it's just an error on the boundary, and the, for the initial condition uh, for the structure equation, this is again just the error the initial error at the uh, at the uh, you know, initial error for the structure uh, problem. Um, so now from here we want to basically derive the error estimate uh, derive the estimate we need in assumption one, roughly speaking. So the way to do that is basically multiply the first um, um, the the equation, so first fluid equation, um, uh, test it with uh, so test it with uh, EVF. You test that with that and take an integral of the whole thing, and then you uh, for the structure equation here you test with partial ESU and partial T. So this one test to the Use this as a test function and do integral part to so take integral and do integral part for structure term, and, and when you do that, um, you you go through all the integral part steps. What happens is um, this thing here uh, get tested with partial ESU partial T. So this term here gets that. Then you do integral part. It gives you two things. 
uh, one is one is this term on the left hand side, which later on this is a it's a time derivative of the integral of the stress. Later on, when we do the when we do the error in the in the L uh, L two in the in the in the in the, in the time domain, uh, this integral end up with give us the initial condition applies on the stress. The other term is right here. The other term, this is when you do the integrated part, you have a boundary term comes around here. So you can see here the 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 uh, the, the residual of the structural boundary conditions um, actually does not appear individually. It appears as a partial derivative of that, roughly speaking. So then after you have this, uh, you do the usual, you know, coach Swartz inequality, Young's inequality, organize things uh, into, you know, since you can you can put the assumption on a regularity of the PDEs, put those things in the constant C1. What you end up with this term, when you do the closure swat, it end up with this term. And you can see that this is only the derivative of RS, uh, of the residual of the um, boundary for the structural equation there, not the boundary, uh, the, not the boundary condition itself. So, so when you have that, we do in another integration, but over time now, and then the, the, the this term here, when you do the integration, integration in time, give you the initial condition, the stress stress initial condition Pentel mentioned before. So this is the extra condition which does not show up in the strong form of the PDE, and and this term here naturally still keep this there, but there is a um, there should be a you know time time integral outside the outside of this term, and this term uh, is the boundary condition for the structure. But it's a derivative of that, time derivative of that. So this one does not appear in the strong form either. So what we do, um, if we just use these two terms uh, in the uh, in the in the least square formulation um, uh, uh, in, in, in the optimizing problem, what end up with is those are derivatives on those residuals. If we use that, since it's derivatives on the on on the residuals, so the residual can differ by a constant. So the solution, if we just train the problem using those two terms, does not give us a good solution. So we have to um, add those strong strong terms back, sort of. Um, so you may ask if um, if uh, we just, G, yeah, I, 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 I am a little confused because. You are analyzing the strong form, but you use the inequality to start with of the variational problem, of the weak yeah, form. So, yeah, so that's that's the, where those two terms come from, right? So um, we we basically what we want to do is we want to um, we want to get uh, we want to verify this assumption, roughly speaking. That's what that's why we start, and uh, the way we do it is by testing the testing it with test functions that do integration by part. And that but, end up. Hold on a second, Georgie, hold on. Yeah. Because the yeah. test functions for neural networks are delta functions. It's a strong form. George, we didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this is Handy uh, from WPI. George, uh, this is actually, this analysis is actually for the stability of the PDEs, not for the mm -hmm. networks. Oh, I see an NN here. I see, no, no, in the yeah, right yeah. Here. So this is and for the, the stability, yeah. But yeah, so the, this assumption here, um, we we try to verify this is for the let, let's say the regularity or stability of the PDE. So to use that in in our analysis, this VI here. Oh, it's uh, of, it's of, I see. Okay, I I, I got it. I got it. Yeah. yeah so yeah. you get the solution there. You put it. Uh, okay, so it's kind of like a mixed. Thing because VNN UNN comes from a, a a strong form, but you put it in the in the in, in the, the, the weak from, from the stability of the weak form. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's where that. Yes. So um, not one of that we do it, uh, after we do the integral parts, then we get those extra terms, and they are missing in the analysis. So the strong form term, the terms from strong form they are missing. So we sort of just add them back. Uh, here, this student just add them back, and luckily this is upper bound, so we can make it slightly bigger by adding the strong, you know, the strong form back. And once we have that, the rest is uh is done for it's straightforward as as usual. I just want to uh reemphasize what Penta mentioned that uh, for the initial structure, the initial condition for the structural part, um the the red one is actually the strong, uh the red term is actually the strong form. 
But this blue one is uh, the uh, uh, initial condition for the stress, which is uh, we derived from the error analysis. And this is the, the second here. This is the boundary term for the structure. Again, the red term is from the strong form, but this term, the, the first term, the blue term is actually from the, the analysis. And the other terms are standard, uh, um, you know, the usual uh, residual term for the for the for the strong form. Then we end up with this uh, uh, error analysis, as you know, Penta showed before. So uh, that's explanation that why we have a little bit extra term and how to apply the general theory to get the uh, the error estimate for the FSI problem. So I can hand over the floor to Penta. Oh, okay. Uh, so we 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 may have a question later. Ah, okay. Let me finish yeah. up. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, you can see me, right? See my screen. Yes. Okay. So uh, now uh, let me uh, continue my my slides. So now it's about numerical experiment. We use our developed this, uh, methodology uh, in the framework of a piece, right? To to do this. Okay. We employ the package of deep XDE. Uh, Specifically, version is a zero point nine zero, since only that version can 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 work for our problem. Uh, with the following uh, uh parameters: three uh, hidden layer, fifty uh neuron in each hidden layer, with time edge as activation function, and add them as optimizer uh, with the initial learning day zero point zero zero one, and we the we 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 do fifty thousand epoch. Uh, uh, for for our following uh, numer uh, numerical examples. So we pick up these functions as our real solution for fluid velocity VF, fluid structure uh, pressure PF, and structure displacement US and VS. Uh, VS here just the, the, the structure uh, velocity, the differentiation of US we got this. Okay, uh, actually we it, it's easy to get those functions as our real solution by properly choosing those uh, right hand side. Of each equation, governing equation, bound condition, uh, interface condition, even in initial condition as well. Uh, since here we do not have, a, we may have some jump on the interface because we have g1, g2, non zero, because we cannot get uh, exactly co continuity across the interface for the uh, picking up uh, real solutions, and we leave that g1, g2, non zero here. But still okay to get the real solution. And we also pick up a highly contrast uh, coefficient. For both fluid and structure, for example, uh, density of fluid is one. However, the density of a lot of uh, structure going to be 10, 000, uh, 10 to 3, uh, 1,000. And uh, viscosity of velocity is the number one. However, the structure um, actually we call it shear modular or Young's modular up to 10 to, 10 to 6. So huge uh, contrast coefficient, jump coefficient as well across the, ac across the interface. Then we are still able to get a kind of reasonable result. Later, you will see that. So first of all, okay, according to our theorem, you see that the, the errors are separated to uh, two parts. One part from the minimization, the other, the other part from the quadrature. And uh, we are assuming, uh, so we cannot do anything about, uh, do, do better thing about the minimization, but we can do something better on the uh, uh, quadrature. So we try to increase the number of uh, sample points to make the quadrature, uh, quadrature uh, error uh, as small as enough. Uh, hopefully, so that's what we do uh, in our numerical environment. So, for example, on the left, this is a uh, two-dimensional, but we do the since we uh, this is a, a d-dimensional. For example, two uh, two-dimensional right now. Uh, right hand side plus one. That's a two plus one dimension. Uh, look like three D now. So we put a, a simple point inside the, uh, the inside the domain omega f omega s as well as a whole as a whole. Simultaneously, which means that we're gonna uh, com combining the time temporal space, we're gonna have the, this three dimensional body all uh, sampled uh, together, and we also uh, we also uh, uh, sample the boundary, uh, which is yellow edge right now. With the simultaneous means, we're gonna we're gonna also uh, uh, sample all those um, uh, six faces of this uh, uh, cube, right? So we also sample the uh, the in in interface, which is circle right now. We should be gonna sample the 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 side, uh, the lateral surface of this uh, cylinder, which already becomes cylinder of the surface uh, for the surface. And uh, okay, if we look at this uh, uh, sampling sampling point set uh, in the three dimensional point of, point of view, you're gonna see we just do this uh, sampling sample this uh, in regular way, regular way. So 
which means we just uh, do this uh, from from left to right, from bottom to uh, to, to top, and then uh, one layer, layer, layer by layer uh, on the on each time level. So you can also try. You can also do the random random sampling, but says oh, oh, the reason why we do the a regular one, a, a uniform one, because we later want to plot the picture using fine element, uh, just like a fine element uh, uh, contour uh, contour pictures. So uh, I mean uniform uniform sampling I give a uniform mesh, which can easily for us to to plot the picture later to show us the uh, result. Okay, this table gives us uh, the the trend, uh, the error trend, uh, following the uh, increasing the sampling point. So we double, uh, we double sample sampling point number of sampling point inside the domain on the first column. Simultaneously, we also double. Uh, uh, doubling the, the sampling point on the boundary, on the interface, also on, in the in, uh, initial domain as well. Uh, so we do the doubling for each. And then we, we, we observe, uh, we, we then uh, uh, train, uh, train our model, try to get the numerical solution uh, based on the DN, uh, uh, DN, DN uh, structure. So this is uh, uh, the errors. You can see that the error trend always uh, Increasing, uh, increase. Uh, sorry, decreasing here. Uh, you 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 should say downward and uh, downward, from uh, along the increasing the sampling point. You see the error always. Although we don't see much about the magnitude uh, reduce reduction, but we do see the number is reducing. I mean the error is reducing. So this is by the way this is a relative error uh, between the numer between the real solution and the DNA solution. And well, you can also see the loss error is very good. So 10 to 5, 10 to, 10 to minus 5, uh, meaning the training, training uh, process is efficient, uh, also accurate, also accurate uh, relatively. And this slide gives give us uh, uh, the counter uh, picture of the result. The first, uh, first rule uh, from left, we have a horizontal velocity, uh, vertical velocity, and a fluid pressure, a fluid pressure. Uh, since the structure doesn't have pressure, so you 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 don't say anything, but just blue means uh, zero uh, inside the circle. Uh, only in the pressure, only in stay with the uh, fluid on the on outside of the circle. Uh, and uh, the second rule here, the picture shows the error, uh, the error distribution of each variable, uh, the horizontal one, horizontal velocity, vertical velocity, and uh, and uh, fluid pressure, uh, fluid pressure. So that uh, error actually around, uh, this is a one level, of, one time level result. Uh, so 10 to minus two, uh, 10 to minus two something. Uh, but uh, the, the error that I showed you in the previous slide, that's the L2 error. Uh, L, L2 error in terms of uh, time and space as well. And, uh, oh, because, okay, I want to say one more thing here. So from the error distribution picture, you see the, the bigger error mainly uh, stay we stay around uh, around the interface. Uh, also something from uh, boundary as well. So it looks like uh, um, from our uh, many many of my uh, simulation using pins uh, to solve those problem solve the PD problem. The arrow uh, from boundary right now from interface are not on euro actually not on euro. So uh, then uh, which implies us, uh, why don't we do the uh, sam uh, adaptive sampling, try to add more uh, sampling point according to the error distribution. So this also a suggestion uh, from one of our reviewers uh, to give us, uh, to let us uh, uh, improve our paper. So that's we, uh, this result is what we added later and, uh, in the review, uh, uh, in the revision of our paper. So we add points of the testing side whose error rank sub five percent, uh, maybe five or, or maybe ten percent. I don't remember correctly. Maybe five percent as well to train the set of the latest level. So this, this uh, the, the 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 picture here shows is our original the sampling point size. So we we adaptively sample once. We got this in three D dimension. You can see that kind of uh, the blue one on uh, the blue part. The blue area just added a new sampling point. And this is twice, uh, second time. For the second time, we sample, for example, uh, we, we adaptively sample in the, the, the training set. We got um, more new uh, points uh, in red, and in red. Oh, actually, red part always uh, like the uh, later, uh, later uh, newly added the sampling point. Oh, you, you, um, this, um, you may not see that so clearly, but if you look at this, uh, 
uh, three-dimensional uh, sampling point of sight from the top. Okay, you see, uh, yeah, it's uh, the 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 new added uh, sampling point mainly uh, surrounding uh, surround this uh, interface uh, right here. Remember, the interface the circle uh, in circle. Some 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 uh, something uh, some of points from the uh, SD and on the boundary a little bit, but mainly uh, surround the interface as well. Uh, you uh, based on this uh, three times uh, uh, resampled uh, resampled training set, we then have uh, yeah, something yeah better result. According to the standard error, uh, according to standard error, you see the error from the uniform I mean or, or original one uh, up to the three time levels adaptive uh, training set. We we have a little bit reduced the error uh, standard, but the mean error doesn't change much. Uh, mean error doesn't change much. The standard error does change a lot. Change some uh, three times reduced. Uh, three times reduced. Okay, so then now. Uh, that's the main result of our numerical method, a numerical experiment. Um, again, as, as, as I said in the beginning, so this, in this paper or in, in, in this talk, we talk about the FSR problem with stationary interface, with, which means the interface doesn't move. But what if the interface is moving? Like uh, what I just uh, introduced in the beginning of my talk, how do we... Uh, like uh, using the traditional finite method to solve those uh, re realistic problem of, F of FS FSI, where the, the, the interface always moves, always deforms, uh, translational moving or even rotating moving. So how do we solve that problem using DNN? So we have, this is still our ongoing work. So our current uh, idea, uh, we have some, uh, yeah, initially we have such idea. Uh, we try. We, we we would like to use the time uh to find different scheme to uh, to create have the temporal derivative, but still use the DNN uh neural network to uh to 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 train the model, but in only in spatial domain, uh which means d dimension, no longer d plus one, uh for this one because of some uh, the moving map mo moving interface indeed give us the challenges. And then LE mapping gonna be used again. So you cannot avoid LE mapping for solving FSR with the moving uh, interface. Just like a uh, traditional method, you can also not uh, cannot also avoid uh, LE mapping if you want to use the interface fated match method. So similarly, we also need LE mapping to to solve FSR problem. Uh, even we use, we still use the neural network uh, in the in in pins approach. Uh, Okay, uh, this is a preliminary result we did so far. You can, you, you see, I can still uh, solve the ALE mapping using a uh, deep neural network method to get such a kind of a moving, uh, uh, moving training set like that. So where you see the in inside the circle because structure uh, uh, do the material, uh, do the, uh, um, we call it like, like round mapping. So the, the material, I mean, structure map doesn't change. A material, uh, the, the, the training set of the drug doesn't change, only doesn't change the uh, the pattern, but but only uh, moving for moving to the right hand side because we're doing the horizontal uh, translation uh, for the structure. As, outside the structure, which is fluid domain, you see the, the training side now is changing, it's moving a little bit, just to adapt to. Uh, adapt to what? Adapt to the interface mo mo uh, motion. We have some. So this is nice, but actually still uh, questionable if we can use this kind of moving training set to solve the FS FSR problem with the moving interface because structure is defined in the Lagrangian domain, which is fixed at time equals zero, initial time. However, at the same time, while the, the, the fluid is moving, because mass is moving, flu fluid domain is moving along with the um, uh, interface. So, so, so you know, after a while, the, 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 the two training side from fluid structure are gonna be conflict with each other. So that is the problem which I just said. So we then have some new idea now. We we, de we have designed a new DNA approach for this realistic FSI problem on a space time training side. So that is the current ongoing work uh, to be continued. So, okay, let me quick make conclusion for, my, for our talk. So match-free method, uh, match-free DMA in the pins of frame has been successfully applied to the dynamic FSR problem with, with, with a stationary interface. Uh, we don't have to uh, handle mesh anymore. Uh, just, we don't like, we, we, we don't need to handle any mesh like we did for the ALE method, for fictitious domain method, we no longer need that kind of approach. Uh, 
uh, to handle mesh. That's the uh, that's the good thing. Uh, that's good thing. And uh, um, something not uh, so good is that uh, as uh, as everyone knows, so the DNA right now has universal conversion, but the conversion rate is not so clear. Is not clear in terms of a uh, number of sampling point, the neuron, or number of layers. So although some people, well, for example, I know that uh, Dr. Jin Chao Xu has done many, has uh, done a very good work uh, with his group uh, on this uh, a conversion rate of uh, DNN, uh, which is comparable, even comparable with the final element method uh, using P uh, as a member, maybe linear element, uh, can even uh, produce the same, same conversion rate. But that one does need a lot of work on the minimization part, uh, which means gonna change uh, change the optimizer, uh, no more item, but a more complicated uh, process, which is probably not very uh, practical in the in the uh, in solving the, the real problem. But right now, I, we don't use that kind of complicated method, but still focus on uh, the, the, the general uh, three, uh, framework of the pins. So that's why. So universal conversion only. And also much more challenging on uh, related I had a problem with moving uh, interface, as I just said earlier, but uh, some new ideas have been formed to conquer them, so which we will study in our next paper. So thank you very much for your attention. So any question? Thank you, Professor Son and Hu, for your great presentation and for your time. So is there any question for the speakers? Maybe Handy has some questions. Yeah, please go ahead. Handy, are you still there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, yeah, I don't have any questions. Have any just questions. Uh, you know, a comment out for the for the convergence uh, for the stability. So the the assumption on this uh, on the on the quadrature rule depends also on the derivatives. So that's uh, that has to be uh, be careful. So the quadrature rules depends on the derivatives of the uh, uh, the networks and the solution itself. Usually, sometimes it could be very um, very contingent. Uh, so, it's a restrict, very restrictive uh, requirement. Uh, you mean that our assumption uh, here, which basically yes, our... if, yeah. So, for example, uh, if uh, if you have second order derivatives to discretize to to have the uh, some nice quadrature rules, you need the third order derivative to be bounded, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Uh, so that could be, you know, for neural networks, uh, uh, I mean, in practical, this probably should be no problem because, you know, the neural networks, you really pick up the low frequency um, solutions. Uh, but, you know, in theory, you know, you cannot have this guarantee for nonlinear equations, especially for Navier Stokes equations like that, uh, mm -hmm. like this kind of equations. Uh, but uh, yeah, thanks for your question. Uh, uh, for the uh, strong form of Navier-Dahl equation, we we you, we always have a uh, uh, u belong to h, uh, so we have space h two per two, uh, and uh, and pressure h two per one. Uh, that's basically satisfy the continuity of uh, derivative. We only need the first order derivative here, actually, which means we have a uh, we have belong to c one, p f belong to c zero, u s belong to c one. Right? So in, yeah, we only need, uh, oh, you know, yeah, sorry. Uh, also second order as, as well, but we, we assume that, we assume that. Uh, numerical, I mean, theoretically, navier dot equation indeed gives us that kind of regularity of a solution. Second order derivative exists, yeah. Okay. So is there any questions? George, do you want to Put comments on the presentation. So, so I I didn't realize I didn't understand at the end. Are you going to um, continue this line, or is it a dead end? We are, we are going to continue. Actually, we have been continuing work on this topic uh, for solving uh, 
FSI with the in, with the moving interface. Yeah, right well, now FSI, it's FSI forward. has a moving interface, and also multi-phase flows have moving interfaces. It kind of as well as well. Yes. Yeah, of yes. course. So so. Uh, um, I think I handled the paper, but I, <laughs> I missed this point. <laughs> I gave you a pass <laughs> on this. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much for that. We are we we appreciate it. we appreciate. It's a it's but a I, tough I, problem I, because we had the moving in, we have um, moving in moving interfaces when we we're doing um, uh, voids and defects in materials, but there was no flow. So there it was all Lagrangian. So then we could map into the reference configuration. Here is also the fluid is moving. So it's really tricky. To, yeah, uh, very tricky. Yes, yes. But the the previous speakers they show results of the, the last example of the first speaker in the previous talk that you may have missed was that uh, he had this uh, mixer. So it was moving. Uh, so it was a fluid structure interaction problem. He was doing that with pins. Uh, also, interface uh, moving or boundary moving? Yeah, but Mo boundary. Not the boundary. Well, the interface. I don't know what you mean about the the I mean, uh, moving or with interface yeah, inside moving. It was a, a mix, you know, a mixer like a propeller, like the one that you show, propeller. Oh, propeller. I see. Okay, that's also uh, yeah. This is rotating yeah, like a rotating turbine. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so it was not it was not um, a deform uh, solid. Um, it was a re it was rigid, so that's the difference. Yeah, that's rigid. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, turbine rigid. Uh, I yeah. Sorry, I I missed uh, his talk. Yeah, which yeah I will later yeah look into what he talked about. Yeah, look about. at the uh, look at the last example. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. In your case, you're looking also at the formations of the bodies, so in the because you're solving the elasticity equations at the same time, so that's a more complicated. You don't know the. Uh, okay. Yeah. So so that's a kind of a little more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, also a lot more complicated. Yeah. Right. And also, besides of that algorithm uh, setup, we also uh, like in in this talk and also in our current paper. Uh, yeah, so, thanks again. Sorry. But why? Uh, why? Yeah. Uh, why can you not uh, use? Um, why can you use uh, the Ayle, the Ayle equation, the arbitrary Lagrangian or Lerner equations, to uh, discretize them directly with uh, pins? Oh, so sorry. Can... What is leading? What are equation again? Sorry, George. The Ayle, the Ayle, Ayle, A L E, the equation. Oh, A L E. Oh, A L E equation. Yeah. Sorry. Why okay. don't you discretize that directly with pins? Yes, we uh, we can do that because LE is uh, is defined by the PDE. That's and why. Then, we and then you can solve a Poisson equation for the uh, mesh velocity using pins. So that implementation, I think, is uh, feasible. Uh, the reason why I said, uh, the reason why I just said if you use uh, um, um, use Eulerian uh, like Rountin. Framework, which means the fluid defined in Eulerian, but uh, structure defined in Lagrangian. Like, yeah, I know. I, I, I've been doing that for a long time. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. Yes, yes. Then the, the sampling point of the structure will 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 stay still, doesn't move. Simultaneously, fluid sampling point in the fluid domain kind of moving along with the uh, interface. So at some time, it must be conflict. Since we use the entire one set of a training set. To solve the entire fluid structure in the right problem. So one set of the training set which is gonna be given to fluid and structure uh, by looking at both point, look at in what domain. So we're gonna separate the one set of the training set to, to both. I don't, and, I don't uh, think I don't think there's a problem, actually, because because you you know you know the uh, on the solid, you know that the fluid is gonna be zero. So, so you, right? The, the, oh, oh the, no, not zero. No, the, no, the no, 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 zero. The training the, the jump, of Yeah, the range. jump. For sure, the jump is zero. The jump is zero. But let's say you have prescribed. Let's simplify it. We have a prescribed velocity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's pretty start, easier. You have so free let me show you the picture again here. Sorry, John. Let me let me yeah, give yeah. you more. If the if the if the if, if the circle the circle uh, the circular domain stratum always stay like this in the first picture, 
but uh, the fluid domain training side keep moving. So you know the fluid, the, the, the sample point of fluid eventually gonna go inside this circle. If the circle doesn't move. Right now, if uh, we keep the structure in on the struct on the like like Lagrangian like uh description, that means that the structure training that will never move, just like that. But why so will you go in since if you will impose a no penetration condition? I'm sorry. You can impose you can impose in the loss, you can impose the no no penetration condition. And um, that's not about uh, boundary condition. It's about uh, how to distribute the sampling point uh, for each sub problem. For, for, the for sampling for points you can the sampling points you can uh, you adaptively you can change adaptively, just like you but do it, adaptive sampling. You can change the, the uh, okay. you don't have to have the same sampling points. I, I don't know. Continuous, yeah, I, the difference is that you have a continuous. Right. You don't even need interpolation because you have a continuous representation of. All the fields. Yeah, I think uh, George, I know what you mean. Actually, uh, theoretically, I think we can still do that. But now, right now, I think the problem is because of uh, uh, the that package uh, invented by you and your group. The PD, the XPD, uh, we don't know how to uh, how to implement such conflicting uh, training set point uh, using that package. Using your package, we don't know how to handle that. So right now we can use that. We, we can use your package to handle interface problem already. Yeah. That's why that's why I told you 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 missed the previous talk. The previous talk they have a library where they have time depend, dependent domains. Oh, they also belong to your group? No, no, no. It's, it's a German group. Oh, German group. Oh, they. Think, oh, they. Oh, they Shao Ji, okay. I think. Uh, I thought I thought you were there. Uh, you, you... Well, I was there at the at the end, towards the end. So I also missed that part. Oh, that's that's an important part because their library has time dependent domains that uh, DPXD does not and modulus does not. Even, oh, even the two sets, two sets of Pytor the yeah. Set. The PyTorch is called the PyTorch there. is called okay. the library. PyTorch has time dependent yeah. domains. That's a, that's what the okay. people were. That's why Nazanin group you in the same in the same in the same uh, time so you could listen to each other. Okay. All right. We will take take uh, yeah look look into that later. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, actually, maybe the problem was on our side because I didn't see the link to the seminar in the email that I sent it again to you. I don't know, was it the second oh, email or it was the first email? Because I I didn't see you joining the seminar. I didn't. Yeah, we didn't receive other email. Only our only the email notice our talk, not other. Not other anyway, talk. look yeah. look it up. So, look it up because I think it's very very appropriate. That mm -hmm. library is exactly what you need. Okay. Yeah, that can be very helpful. Yeah, we will look into that. Actually, we still. Uh, yeah. Also, right now, you know, we also have a. We are we're we're doing right now. I uh, thought. Let me tell you a little bit. So we are trying to. Uh, uh, to the fluid domain from the Eulerian back to the Lagrangian. We're going to solve the whole FSI in the Lagrangian description. They're no longer moving. <laughs> I'm doing right now like this, but more complicated since the equation going to be changed a lot. Since we change the variable, then there are going to be a lot of Jacobian matrix there in the fluid equation. But then the mesh, I mean, the, the training set no longer move. That's another way I can solve that problem. But I, I'm, I'm still working on that. We are still working. Okay. Hopefully, I'm, we can do this in our life to work. Yeah. Okay. Nazari, maybe you can. You. Yeah, okay. I think there is no no question. Right. So it's time to conclude the session. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.